Hello Year 10, welcome to your first online lesson with me Martin. Uh, today we're going to learn about how our solar system formed. Before we start I think it's important that I explain how these online lessons are going to work. So we're going to continue learning about the universe and our solar system until the end of this term and I will be expecting you to take notes in the book that we provided and online and I'll explain how we're going to do that online in just a second. Um, but if you could start with me just now by putting the heading um, accretion which I'll show you in a little second and the date is the 24th of the 3rd 2020. So you can put that at the top of your book we're going to treat it like every other lesson and then we're going to have a look at the Google Classroom just now but hopefully this should work, this should be fun and if you're paying attention or doing this lesson during the timetable time uh, I will be accessible online as well so we can discuss anything, any questions you have please feel free to get in touch with me and I'll respond to them during class time if you respond later on that's okay but I probably won't get to it until it's scheduled for the timetable again so just try and be on at the right time and we can catch any problems or any questions you may have at that moment in time which would be awesome. Okay let's look at Google Classrooms before we start properly. So I'll just get here. Okay so if you log on to Google Classrooms and you go into Year 10 Science this is what you should see. So there's not much going on now but as we progress there'll be more information um, and the more lessons that we upload. What you should see just now is this part here. It says Martin Hughes posted a new assignment, accretion. So accretion is going to be the heading today. That's what we're going to be talking about most of today. If you click on this link and go to instructions. Okay, this is what you should see. It says, make sure you can see the Google slide questions attached to this assignment. That's this part here. Okay, you should see accretion questions. And these are the Google slides. It says, have a quick read through the questions. We'll do that in a little second. Then watch the YouTube video in this link, which you're doing right now. You may wish to pause the YouTube video to help you answer the questions. So you'll see the questions in a little second. I'm going to be doing this like a normal lesson in class, but the beauty of it is you can pause my voice anytime you want. Um, so that may be a good thing for you. Um, when you pause it, you may take some of the information I've just spoken about or there might be a lecture slide relevant to the questions in these Google Slides. So we'll look at that in a little second. Once you've answered all the questions, I want you to please move on to the extension material below. Watch the video here. What was the young earth like? So if you click this link, it'll open an MP4. And then I want you to read this article on how our solar system formed. So this is after you've finished the Google slide questions. So if you race through it and you do, do it quite quickly, that's fine. But there's these two other things I want you to do. If you just get finished the Google slides today and that's you finished for the day in science, that's okay too. But what I'd like you to do is perhaps watch these videos and read this article before our next science lesson because I'm going to be asking some questions we will be going over these again, but if you get finished quite quickly, these extension materials are here for you as well. So let's have a look at the Google Slides. If you click on accretion questions, it will load up a bunch of slides. Now, it takes a little while, so don't panic if it doesn't load up straight away, depending on how good or bad your internet connection is. But they will load up here on the left hand side, and there should be eight slides in today's lesson. Let's just have a look at them. So, as ever, we have our do now questions. Don't worry about that if you're worried about not having do now questions. We will have do now questions on the Google Slides. And what I'd like you to do, we'll talk about the answers in a little second, but if you look through each of the Google Slides in your own time, you will see there is a bunch of questions related to the lesson that I'm going to give you in a little second. What I'd like you to do is where it says answer here. You can click with your mouse and you can put your answer here. And if you want to be really clever, which would be fantastic for me, if you do me a massive favor, 
if you go to text color here at the top and make it red, then that's your answer. And that automatically uploads to Google Classroom. So as you're typing, I can actually check what you guys are up to. So I will mark this, I will look over it, and the answers you put in, I can give you comments back as well. If you could highlight it in red, fantastic. Um, it's here again, text color. I'll put that back to black. If you don't highlight it, that's not the end of the world, but if you could, that would be amazing. Okay, so what I'd advise you to do is perhaps pause this video just now, find where the Google Slides are in the Google Classroom, and have a look at some of these questions, okay? These questions will be answered if you pay attention to my lesson. And what I hope you may do is if you have YouTube open in one window with me talking, when you realize, okay, that's a question I need to answer, pause my video, go to the Google slide and answer that question, okay? So hopefully that works quite well. And again, if that's not quite working for you, just give me feedback. We can change this. I think this is probably going to be the easiest way for us to, to move forward. Okie dokes. Let's get on with the lesson. So, as promised, we have our do now questions. So what you want to do is write down these do now questions in your book if you want to do that or answer them on the Google Slides. That's entirely up to you what way you do it. The do now questions are, number one, what are massive star explosions called? What are massive star explosions called? Number two, what are star nurseries called? What do we call star nurseries? Question three, how do we arrange stars? How do we arrange stars? So what do I mean by that? Last week we looked at different characteristics of stars. We looked at color, temperature, luminosity and size. So how do we arrange stars? What is the main characteristic that we look at when we arrange them? Question four, what is the brightest star that we can see in the night sky? What is the brightest star that we can see in the night sky? So we looked at this star when we were classifying, I asked you guys to give me the color, luminosity and size uh, about different types of stars on a table. And the brightest star was in among one of those stars. And what kind of star is our sun? What kind of star is our sun? I've given you a hint. It is, starts with an M, sequence star. Starts with M and it's a sequence star. What is the M? So you may want to pause the video here. Please have a crack at it. And then I'll go over the answers in two seconds. So write these down in your book if you want, or answer them on Google Slides. And if you pause the video now, I'll go over the answer. Okay, so our do now questions. What are massive star explosions called? So they're called supernova. Supernova explosions, remember, only happen when we have a high mass star. High mass are big stars, and they fill up with that iron core. And when they fill up with iron, nuclear fusion can't happen anymore. The star starts to collapse in on itself, and the whole thing explodes. Supernova, or supernovae, are really, really important because they forge all of the other chemical elements in the periodic table beyond iron, which the clever people who have remembered was 26 protons. So that's quite a heavy element. Question two, what are star nurseries called? These are called nebula. So some nebula we can see images of, they look stunning. If you go online and Google nebula, nebulas are big clouds of dust and gas that eventually can collapse together to form a new star. So we call them star nurseries. How do we arrange stars? Primarily by temperature and luminosity. So temperature, how hot the star is, is what we usually classify or arrange the star. And luminosity, remember, is the scientific name for brightness. Talking of brightness, number four, what is the brightest star that we can see in the night sky? 
The brightest star that we can see is called Regal, and this is the brightest star we can see in the night, star, uh, night sky, Regal. And question five, what kind of star is our sun? It is a main sequence star. Now this means it is basically middle middle aged. It's doing exactly what it needs to be doing. It's uh, the middle of its life and it's basically just turning hydrogen and hydrogen into helium. And we call these main sequence stars. So if you got most of those, congratulations. If you didn't get any, that's okay. We can maybe do a bit of revision. Um, but well done for doing your dinner questions. Let's move on. So I just spoke about supernovae. Okay, we know these fantastic explosions that forge all the chemical elements needed to form the periodic table beyond iron, and all of the atoms in your body were formed in a star or inside a dying star. So these are really important things that happen without us even thinking about it. But without them, there would be no life. So we talked about stars, but we know that life can't happen on stars. So Supernova are really important for another reason. So we have these things that we've not mentioned before called supernova remnants or shortened to SNR. Supernova remnants means the aftermath, the remnants of a supernova explosion. So after you get that fantastic explosion, we have this kind of dust cloud that just kind of hangs in space. And these are really, really important forming new stars, but even more complex things can form around these areas, which are planets. And we're going to explain today, how do we get planets after a supernova explosion? Specifically, how did we get the planets in our solar system? So, first off, I'm just going to briefly mention accretion. Accretion is really important because it is the process in which planets and other celestial bodies, when I say celestial bodies, I'm talking about objects in space. How do they form? How do we get things like comets, meteorites, asteroids and planets? Well, remember one of the four fundamental forces, which is really important in this process, uh, gravity. So gravity, as we know, is stronger where there's more stuff. So when we talk about accretion, we're talking about planets forming through clumping together of rock. And the more rock that clumps together, the bigger the rocky body becomes. And therefore, gravity becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. So it's pulling in all of these rocks all of the time. So accretion is something that is super important in the formation of planets. And accretion can begin when you have one of these supernova remnants, this big dust cloud, and a new star forms in the middle of that dust cloud. And that's exactly what happened in our own solar system. So what I'd like you to make a note of, and I think it's in one of the Google slides, is this is the definition of accretion. So the textbook definition of accretion is the growth or increase by the gradual accumulation of additional layers of matter. So it's the growth or increase by the gradual accumulation of additional layers or matter. So it's not a very quick process. It's a gradual process because if you think as it's getting bigger and bigger, it gains more momentum and gets bigger as a result of the accretion process. And one of the ways that we can describe this that helps us kind of metaphor uh, in our head is, that's just the Crab Nebula, which looks amazing, is through the snowball effect, okay? So we're not talking about snowballs for temperature. And this might be lost in a few of you because you're Australian, I get that. In Scotland, we had a lot of snow. And if you imagine you had a small snowball and you push it down a hill that's covered in snow, by the time it gets to the bottom of the hill, it's huge. Okay, and the reason for that is because it's clumped all the snow as it's went down the hill and got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's a similar sort of process when we're talking about the accretion of planets. Okay, it's gradual and they accumulate in size as they pick up more rocks hitting off them, pulled in by gravity. 
So again, we just talked about snowballs, but this is reality, what's happening, we're talking about rocks. It's hard for us to kind of visualize how that happens, but it's very, very similar to pushing a snowball down the hill. So how did our solar system form? Well, I'm going to talk about the processes, the steps, um, through a little timeline that helps explain how our own solar system formed, how the planets started to accrete in their orbits around the sun, uh, the sun and why the inner planets seem to be heavier and rocky, or they are, and the outer planets are large and gassy. So I'm going to talk you through this little timeline that's from NASA. So if you see on the left-hand side, 4.6 billion years ago was when our solar system began to form. It began about 4.6 billion years ago in a wispy cloud of gas and dust. So probably the supernova remnant that I mentioned at the beginning of the lesson. Now this cloud was a small part of a much bigger cloud and at some part, point, sorry, part of the cloud collapsed in on itself. And we think that the cloud collapsed in on itself because there was perhaps another supernova explosion nearby that caused the cloud to compress. The result of this compression was a flat spinning disk of dust and gas. So you imagine this big supernova explosion hitting this cloud and the cloud getting spun around, okay? And this kept spinning and spinning and formed a flat spinning disk of dust and gas. Nuclear fusion occurs when hydrogen atoms fuse into helium, we know that, and this started to happen in the middle of this cloud, okay? Nuclear fusion started to happen in the middle of this new cloud, this flat disk. When enough material collected in the disk's centre and the nuclear fusion began, that's when our sun was born. So a new star formed in the middle of this flat spinning cloud. And this new star, which is our sun, gobbled up 99.8% of all the material that was in that cloud. Almost everything went into that cloud. So the rest of our solar system was made with this tiny, tiny amount of material. But it was enough to create our solar system. The material left behind by the sun clumped together into bigger and bigger pieces through accretion and started to form planets. These clumps became planets, dwarf planets, asteroids, comets, and moons. We're going to talk about them in more detail. So only rocky things could survive close to the sun, so the gassy and icy materials collected further away. And that's how our solar system became the place it is today. So let's talk about that just for a little second. So it says only rocky things could survive close to the sun. So when the sun formed, it gave out a lot of radiation. It was giving out a lot of energy. And when it did that, it pushed all the lighter elements away from the sun. So we know that hydrogen only has one proton. Helium has two protons. Lithium has three. So these really light elements were pushed out. But the heavier elements like iron, which we know has 26 protons, wasn't pushed away. And that's why the outer planets that we see in our solar system are made of light gases, mainly like hydrogen. And the planets closest to the sun, Venus, Mercury, Earth and Mars, are all made of kind of heavy rock materials. But they're much smaller planets as a consequence. So that's why we have this kind of arrangement of planets in our solar system because the heavy materials could stay close to the sun and the lighter materials got pushed out because they were too light and the radiation pushed them all the way to the outer limits of the solar system. Comets and asteroids are the leftover remains of the solar system's formation. So when you see shooting stars, stars at night, this is bits of space rock that are burning up in our atmosphere and comets are really important. We're going to talk about them in the next lesson uh, with regard to ice. So comets can have a lot of ice on them, and some scientists believe that's actually how we got our water here on Earth, was that the Earth was bombarded with comets that were covered in ice that melted and formed our oceans. But there's a bit of debate over that, but we're going to discuss that in the next lesson. Okay, so 4.6 billion years ago, 
our sun formed just like any other star that we've talked about so far. The clouds of atoms and dust being pulled together by gravity and a supernova explosion nearby is believed to have moved the gas cloud so much that it began to collapse in on itself and this caused the cloud to compress. And I talked about this spinning disc. Okay, it has a special name. So, if we look at this little diagram here, we have A, B, C and D. So A is our dust cloud, we then get the supernova explosion, the compression of the cloud into B, okay, and you can kind of see this proto-sun, and I'll explain what that means, proto-sun forming in the middle. Then C, we do have the formation of our sun, okay, that's stabilised, but you can see the rings around the sun, we still have this flat spinning disk, and the rings around the sun, these planets started to form through accretion, and then eventually D, and uh, we have our solar system that we see today. So there's a big process involved there. And this flat spinning disk is something that we see throughout many celestial objects, things in the universe. And it has a really long name um, that we are going to try and remember. Okay, These big flat spinning disks are called protoplanetary disks. Okay, Usually made of hydrogen, silicates, which is like rock, iron and water and together they form protoplanetary disks which has been shortened to proplids. So the short name of a protoplanetary disk is a proplid. You can see what they've done there, they've taken pro, the pl from planetary and the yd from planetary then to planetary and d for disk. Proplid. So that will be a brand new name I think for most people. And we see many proplids throughout the universe. So our own galaxy, the Milky Way, is that flat spinning disk. And even the rings around Saturn um, have that flat disk shape. So these should be familiar to us, but we've probably just not known the term proplid before. So I don't want you guys missing out just because we're online from any terrible, terrible memory aids that I can come up with. So the way I like to think of these proplids is that somebody's making pizza, okay? You see people spinning the pizza dough, it gets flatter and flatter the more they spin it. And proplids, my favorite kind of pizza, um, is made of pepperoni, that's the P. Red capsicum, that's the R. Olives, that's contentious, that's a bit of debate with other people, but I love olives. Pepper, it needs to be a bit spicy. Lamb, it's pretty damn good. Yellow capsicum, and of course you have the dough to put it all on. So, if you ever just want to make me a pizza, that's not actually a good memory aid. That's just because I'm hungry for pizza. So, if anyone wants to make me a pizza, um, that's what I'd like. Thank you very much. But a proplid, if you remember in your head, we're talking about the spinning action. It's a flat spinning disc. Okay? Kind of like a pizza. So, I used the term proto-sun before. So, what does that mean? Well, we need to look at proto first because we probably know what sun means and we know what planet means. We can also talk about proto planets. So what does proto mean? Well, proto is Greek um, for original or primitive. So original or primitive forms. So you may have heard of a prototype before. Um, and this is the first version of a device or a vehicle from which other forms are, are developed. So you may have heard of a prototype before. I'll read that again. This is the first version of a device or vehicle from which other forms are developed. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we're talking about that, we apply that to planets and suns. A protoplanet is the original planet that the planet may form from. So our sun, sorry, our, our Earth when it was forming looked very different from what it does today because it was still um, getting bombarded with asteroids and comets and so when we talk about a proto-earth it was still going to be the earth but it wasn't quite the same as what it is now so when I talk about the proto-sun it was still always going to be our sun as we know it today but it was an earlier version of that it looked kind of different and it was a lot hotter a lot of radiation coming from it so a proto-planet and a proto-sun are the kind of pre- planets or pre-suns to what we know now um, and that's where we get the word from prototype 
So just to highlight, uh, prototype cars are pretty cool. Um, they design these mad cars that look super futuristic, knowing that they're never really going to put them on the roads. Um, but prototype cars, pretty cool. If you're into that sort of thing, have a look online. But prototypes can be used for a whole bunch of different things. Um, usually electronics as well. They may form a prototype before they mass produce a better version. Okay. So that was what our proto sun probably looked like. A big kind of hazy cloud around it in terms of a propylid and the proto sun forming in the middle. Now I talked about protoplanets and something we need to discuss is collisions. Okay, protoplanet collisions were crazy big. Um, our own moon used to be part of Earth and there was a massive planet that smashed in. I'll talk about that in the next lesson. But if you think about these huge asteroids hitting off each other, you're going to have lots of craters, uneven surfaces, and one of the main points of evidence that we have that this process actually happens is looking at our moon. So I think I've mentioned that in the past, um, this term. But if you look at our moon at night, particularly under a telescope, you'll be able to see these massive craters. And those craters were formed when the moon was forming through this process of accretion. So it's a very violent process, generates a lot of heat, um, and obviously the impact itself can really disrupt the surface area of a planet. It can make it bigger, it can rip chunks off of it. So it's it's quite a, a an amazing catastrophic process. So this is kind of what we think happened when these planets were forming. So if you look at this graph, one is furthest away, two and three, so that's time. You can see that on the left hand side. So as time goes on, as time gets closer to the modern day where we are now, this is what we think happened. So we look at the first line, number one, we have a whole bunch of protoplanets forming uh, in an orbit around the sun. Okay, so imagine these are all just in Earth's current orbit. We just have a big chain, which looks like Maltesers. Maybe I'm just hungry, I keep thinking about pizza and Maltesers. We look at these protoplanets, okay, and they start banging into each other. Giant impacts. And this causes a lot of space debris. Okay, we have a lot of rocks spattered out. And we call these this, this debris GIFs. So we're not talking about GIFs that you look at your cat GIFs online. We're talking about giant impact fragments. These giant impact fragments are hoovered up by the larger protoplanets and eventually you get this process of re-accretion. So when a big planet forms or hits another planet, it gets a lot of dust and uh, rock into the atmosphere and then that is re-accreted into a bigger planet. So the planets get bigger um, but the number of planets gets smaller. So then eventually you just have one or two massive protoplanets in an orbit and eventually they will form probably just one planet in that orbit. So you can see over time the number of protoplanets gets less because they're all hitting it off each other and getting destroyed but the size of the planets gets bigger over time. So what I'd actually really like you to do at this point is maybe pause the video and if you could draw that diagram that would be superb. So it might take you a few minutes but if you can draw that diagram with all of the labels, that'd be fantastic. So you can maybe do that in your book just now and pause me. Okay, so eons. Let's talk about the early Earth. So this happened, remember, about 4.6 billion years ago, the solar system started to form. And our Earth is believed to be between 4.6 and 4 billion years old. So this is quite a long time ago compared to you know, recent, uh, our own understanding of time, but not that long ago when you think that the universe is 13.8 billion years ago. So in geological time, it's not that long, but we need to give these specific areas of time uh, designated categories, which we call eons. Eons are basically, yeah, categories of time. So the first eon that we're talking about with Earth is called the Hadean Eon. H-A-D-E-A-N. The Hadean Eon occurred 4.6 to 4 billion years ago. And you'll see this little graph here. It's a timeline. Okay, so the Earth 
began forming. That's what coalescing means. We'll talk about that next lesson. But the Earth formed. Then we got water on Earth. Then the Moon formed through a massive collision with another protoplanet. There was core accretion, so our layers, you know, we talk about our core, inner core, mantle and crust. That started to form, which is really important for a bunch of reasons. One of them being our magnetic field, which formed next. And then we had our late bombardment stage, which was uh, near the end of the Hadean Eon. We had a ton of asteroids bombarding the Earth. So it looked very different to what the Earth looks like now. But this is the first Eon we're going to be talking about, the Hadean Eon. So we're going to look at this one first. So this is the last thing we're going to talk about today, but the Hadean Eon um, or the Hadean Earth looked very, very different from the Earth that we have today. You can see here it's just a big ball of red lava, it looks like, being bombarded by asteroids. Um, there's no water at all to speak of right at the beginning. The sun was highly, um, it was giving off a lot of radiation and there was a lot of remnant radiation from the other supernova that we presume exploded nearby us. So not conducive to life at all. Um, if it was like that today, none of us would be here. Um, but this is what the Earth looked like between 4.6 and 4 billion years ago in the Hadean Earth. So lava, hot, high radiation. And if you watch that video that I asked you to watch uh, is the extension exercise. Um, our friend, Professor David Christian from the Big History Project, he does a really nice video explaining what would it be like for a human to be uh, in the Hadean Earth. So I'd advise you to watch that. Okay. So, like I just said, I'd advise you to go watch that video on Google Classrooms. And once you've watched that video, I'd like you to read the article, How Our Solar System Is Formed. And it's got a lot of great information regarding the other planets in our solar system. I've mainly just spoken about Earth today. Um, so we're going to talk about some of those other planets later on as well. So I'd like you to read that article if you, if you have time. Um, and we will discuss that in more detail later on. But we're going to go through those steps of the Hadean Eon next lesson, and then we'll maybe revisit some of this stuff in the third or fourth lesson. So it's worthwhile planting the seeds now in your head and getting ahead of the game. And thank you for paying attention. I hope that was okay. Please get in touch if you need any, any help with anything at all. Thank you.